Praise God, everybody. Praise God. Good morning, all. Welcome to the house of our God. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the lyrics of that song in a minute. That's a new song for us. But today we want to talk about the church of Christ and uh, the lyrics of that song. It told us when the church of Christ was born. And I think God wants to speak to us from that place this morning. But however, before we do, I want to acknowledge, I want to acknowledge all of you today. I know some of you call the church house with your prayer requests, and I want you to know that we pray for you. Um, and if you do have a prayer request, we encourage you call, you know, Sister Helen, you are so faithful. God bless you. I mean, Sister Helen, first of all, she won't let you off the phone without praying for you. You know that. <laughs> And uh, praise God. But this is a house of prayer. Alicia, we've been praying for you and George. Uh, we've been praying for many of you. We've been praying for you, Damon. We've been praying for you, Donald. Those of you who call the house, we pray for you all. But when there's a specific, a specific request, we do pray for those specific requests. Amen. So we want you to know this is a house of prayer. Right now we're praying for you, Nina, and for Terry. We're praying for you guys. We hear. And uh, God put us together for reason, for purpose. We're praying for you. Uh, who are you over there? Who am I looking at? What's your name, Sister Peg? <laughs> we might not remember the name, but say, God, you know the face that's in front of me right now. <laughs> and uh, we want you to know this is a house of prayer. And if you need prayer, so you can see us privately, you can call us, but you are prayed for, you are cared for, you are loved, and God will hear our prayer. Amen. Very good. So with that, everybody, I want to talk to you today. The title of our conversation is The Church of Christ. The Church of Christ. And um, I do thank you, Trick and Tigaloo, for doing these songs on short notice and these new songs. I love the new songs. I hope you like them. Praise God. I feel the power of God in them. Um, I feel God speaking to us in them and through them. Amen. It's good doctrine. Aren't some of these songs just good doctrine? It's good theology. So um, I think, however, I would like to start today with a story about Pastor Judy Porzio, one of our founding pastors who stood side by side with my father at the beginning of this ministry 36 years ago. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So um, I would like to share to you a story about or two about our pastor, Judy Porzio. I believe it was the mid 1990s that Pastor Judy, she had a traveling ministry and she would go and travel to different churches and preach. And uh, you, you, you know, certainly that our pastor, Judy, was anointed to preach and she was anointed to preach a particular message. One of the particular messages that she was anointed to preach was in regard to the three major feasts of the Old Testament, which are Passover, Pentecost, and in gathering. And um, I was blessed enough to be able to travel with her from time to time as her armor bearer, in case anybody wanted to know what the heck I was doing there. I gave him a church title, I'm her armor bearer, that means you better be careful. <laughs> It was my pleasure. <laughs> it was my pleasure. But, you know, um, they really treated my mother well, Pastor Judy, as she traveled from church to church. I remember one time she was traveling to a church, I think, in Georgia, and uh, a small church, um, uh, small in comparison to the mega churches, but there were a couple of hundred people there to uh, um, greet our Pastor Judy. And the pastor of the church wanted to honor Pastor Judy, so when uh, we drove into town, we, we were put up at the finest motel in town. It was the finest motel. But um, the pastor wanted to greet uh, my mother, so on, he had written on the marquee, we've probably shared this story before, it said, welcome, Pastor Judy Porzio, on the marquee of the motel. And right underneath it was $69 a night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the presti prestigious travels of Pastor Judy Porzio. <laughs> and I remember when the pastor came to pick her up that night, he was like, oh, I am so sorry. <laughs> but he was laughing. <laughs> pastor Judy Porzio, $69 a night. <laughs> so he assured her that her offering would be more than that. <laughs> Anyway, just good humor. <laughs> I do recall another time that I traveled with her. 
and we were at another church, and, and one of the, the messages that Pastor Judy was anointed to preach was the three feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and in gathering. So she would go on a, a weekend seminar with them. She would preach on Saturday, Passover. Sunday morning would be Pentecost. Sunday evening would be in gathering. And some of you know this story, those of you who have been around for a while, but it was Sunday morning, and my mother was you know, getting ready to preach on the Feast of Pentecost, but she was not feeling very good that day. And she said, Michael, I cannot go. You're going to have to go for me and preach. I said, Mom, this is not going to happen. I don't know what on earth you need, but I'm going to get it. <laughs> I traveled everywhere. I got medicine. I got food. I got orange juice, whatever it took. Finally, she said, Michael, you know I'm not going, right? So I said, okay. So, uh, you know, of course, I'm, I'm a child. I'm nervous. I don't know what I'm doing. So it's like, okay, Mom, I'll go and preach the Pentecost on Sunday morning. So I, I think, I've, as I've told you, the one who was more unhappy than me was the pastor of the church who discovered that I was going to preach Sunday morning. He was not happy, and he let me know it. <laughs> well, whatever, you know. So... Um, <laughs> so I said, Pastor, that's how it's going. So uh, he let me preach uh, that Sunday morning on Pentecost, on Pentecost. And uh, it's, it's always amazing how God works. You know, when I got up to preach, the anointing came, and I was, a, I was afraid of nothing. Um, preached the word of God, didn't care who thought what, but, I, you know, I wanted to minister. We had an altar call. The whole church came up. Praise God. Pastor still wasn't happy with me, though. <laughs> But uh, Pastor Judy, by, by a, a mighty hand of God, felt better that afternoon, and she came to preach the final message that night on a gathering. So uh, we left on good terms. <laughs> but I want you to know that even, I want, I want to talk a little bit about foundation, foundation of this church, perhaps, foundation of, of, of um, you know, what, what we're supposed to build upon. Because I do believe that Pastor Judy was anointed. I believe that she was anointed even for that particular teaching in regard to Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. I would like to read a passage, if I may. I'd like to read from the sixth chapter of Hebrews, if you have your Bibles. Brother Keith, I'm going to do nothing but King James today. I just got a couple of verses. So I'll turn to Hebrews chapter 6. How you doing, guys? Have you been reading your Bibles? So have I. Really, I really have. I, I've started again. <laughs> no, I, I, what I've really been doing as, as of late, I, I put the electronic stuff away, you know, and I wanted to, to get familiar with the Bible again. So I, I've been opening up the pages again. Hebrews chapter 6. And let's, let's just read a couple of verses together. It says, therefore, right in the beginning, therefore, leaving the principal foundations, uh, the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands even the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Scripture teaches us that these are the foundations of our faith, the foundations, that we need to build upon these foundations. And Pastor Phil and I, we believe that we are anointed to build upon the foundations in which have been laid. So we will not lay again the foundations, but we truly stand upon them and we build upon them, amen? We stand upon the shoulders of giants, yes we do. But we will not lay again the foundation. I want to speak about our foundations, but not preach upon them. The foundations are the laying on of hands. The foundations are the baptisms. The foundations are repentance from dead works. Some folks say, don't you lay hands on anymore. Don't you baptize anymore. If you need it, we'll give it to you. But that's foundational stuff. You know, we need to grow up, everybody. Amen? We need to mature in the body of Christ. We need to tell you that you are the anointed one. You don't need someone to lay a hand upon you. Amen. You need to know that you're forgiven, that you are loved, that you are the sons and daughters of God. Uh, you know, every now and again, somebody has a bad week and they want to get baptized in water again. I try to tell them with the greatest of love, we're not baptizing you again. You know, once is enough. And you have not fallen from the graces of God. Amen, everybody. And, and, and we build upon these foundations that are absolutely tried and true. Amen. 
but, but I, I do believe that, that, that Pastor Phil and myself, that we are anointed to build upon this foundation in regard to the three feasts. And I want to talk about them again. Passover, Pentecost, and in gathering. But I must say, we also believe that God has anointed, this is interesting, he has anointed all of you with the Cyrus anointing in this year, 2024. Have you read our text this year, Isaiah 45? It's called the Cyrus anointing, where God told Cyrus, I've anointed you to restore and to rebuild. So this message is for each and every one of us. We have been anointed to build upon the foundation in which have been laid. Amen. And if you have been anointed, that means you are empowered. Man, it means that you are the guys on earth that have the power of heaven to do what God has called you to do. Praise the Lord, everybody. Yes, indeed, there is a power of God, there is a power of heaven, and if you're wondering where it's at, it resides, there is a clove of fire right on top of your head, just as it was in the days of Pentecost, a clove of fire upon each one of your heads, indicating the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you, amen. Where the church of Christ was born on the day of Pentecost, empowered by the Holy Spirit to fulfill the purpose of the church. And we will clarify that today, amen, the very purpose of the church, praise God. We've been called to pour down the heavens upon the earth so that heaven, the heavens would truly produce salvation. So scripture does teach us that the church of Christ was born at Pentecost. We'll turn to that text in a second. In a second. Pentecost, the church of Christ. I want you to know the church of Christ, this is important. The church of Christ it's not just one of the many religions upon the earth. Sometimes we view Christianity and we live Christianity as if it's one of the many religions. Make no mistake, the church of Christ is not one of the many religions of the earth. The church of Christ transcends every worldly institution, every worldly system. The church of Christ transcends them all, amen. And we are called to usher in the greatest harvest of all, which is the Feast of Ingathering. Amen, everybody. And in this year, 2024, I believe that we are all anointed to restore the souls of mankind back to the Father. Yes, indeed. And, and you know, so many times I see us looking at Christianity as if it's just one of the religions. Oh, my goodness. And you, you could go to church and you could have your Christianity if that's what you want. If you want to be part of a, a religion and you want to say Christianity is your religion, fine. You can be one of the many religions, but, but there's, something, there's something greater that we're called to, Amen. which is Christ. The church of Christ transcends it all. The church of Christ has no competition. Can I get an amen from you? Amen. The church of Christ has nothing to prove, nor does the church of Christ have any, has any enemies. The church of Christ is placed upon this earth to bless the entire world, to embrace the entire world, to love something like for God so loved the world. Amen. Amen. That he gave and he forgave. This is what the church of Christ is called to do. It transcends it all. When you are part of a Christian religion, well, you don't forgive the entire world. When you're part of a Christian religion and not the church of Christ, we have a tendency to damn the world to hell. And we become, I don't know, we think that we're judge and jury and we know who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. Well, maybe if you're part of a Christian religion. But if you know that you have been birthed at the day of Pentecost, and if you know that you are truly a part of, of the church of Christ, you know that we transcend it all and we watch over all of humanity. Amen. That God put us in place for the great and gathering. And it's to restore the souls of mankind, everybody. And restore means to give back what was once lost. And a lot of people have lost their peace. They've lost their joy and they've lost their sound mind. And the church of Christ is called to restore the souls of men back to the father. A lot of people have forgotten that they are children of God. A lot of people have forgotten that they're loved. A lot of people have forgotten they're forgiven. And the church of Christ... We are called to restore the souls of mankind. Make no mistake and do not forget who we are and what we're called to do. And during the course of the day, you all might do different things. But I pray that you always have a divine encounter, a divine reminder to know why you deal with people in life. You know, 
Sometimes you just get lost in, in the problems of your jobs and the problems of your relationships and the situations of life and we forget who we are. We forget that we are not part of the problems of this world. We are absolutely the answer. And if you're ever involved in a mess, it's because you're there for a reason, everybody. Can I get a witness? Yes, indeed. There's purpose in it all. You're there to save a soul for you to show them heaven. Amen, everybody. Yeah, truly. Truly, truly. So with that, maybe we should take a look. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 1, where, where the church of Christ is born. The church of Christ is, is, is transcends all religions of this world. Everything is beneath it because we are here to love and save them all. Praise God. So, so when the church of Christ was born here in Acts 1, you remember Acts 1, this is when Jesus was resurrected from the dead and for 40 days he walked on the earth and he showed himself to many people and before he was taken up into heaven he told his disciples right there in verse 6 he said um, he says when they therefore were gathered and come together they asked him the disciples asked Jesus saying Lord will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel and Jesus said it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive what? You shall receive power. Amen. You shall receive power in your mortal bodies. You shall receive power from on high. You will know that you are more than human. You are touched by God to restore the kingdom of heaven. They didn't know that they were the ones who were to restore the kingdom of heaven. But God said, not until you are touched with power from on high. And that is the birth of the church, everybody. Amen. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be what, everybody? You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. You want to say that with me? And in all of Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen. Amen. When the disciples asked Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom? They were asking Jesus, are you going to make Israel great again? Remember? Remember the days of King David and King Solomon? You know, at that time they were under Roman rule. It says almost there was like two thirds of the population was slaves. They lived in such hard times and they wanted Israel to be restored. And Jesus said, he said, essentially, you are the ones who are going to restore the kingdom. And with the restoration of the kingdom wasn't about getting houses and cars and, you know, prestige. It was about saving mankind. It was about restoring the souls of mankind back to God again, because such is the kingdom of God. For what is the kingdom of God, everybody? What is the kingdom of God? It's people. Yes, it's righteousness. Yes, it's peace. Yes, it's joy. But it's people that contain those things. The kingdom of heaven is souls restored back to the Father. Oh, man, I got some really interesting things to say, I might say. <laughs> I, know, I hope you'll agree. <laughs> I've got a few interesting points here today because the church of Christ, and I'm going to get there in a second, is called to restore the souls of mankind. Oh, my. Yeah, let's read another passage. Matthew. All right, let's talk about the church of Christ one more time. Yeah, Matthew 16. Yes. So the first time the word church was used in the Bible was right here in Matthew 16, the first time the word church was and it's from Jesus himself. Uh-huh. The church of Christ. So Matthew 16, let's do verses 18 through 19. Just seeing who's turning. Anybody turning? You got your Bibles? You turning? All right. You want to start reading without me? <laughs> all right thanks for waiting here you know as we read the passage you know it's a familiar one and I this is Jesus speaking and I say unto you Peter he says he says thou art Peter 
And I, I can't start there. I'm sorry. Um, let's see. Let's start with verse 15. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And then, and I say unto you, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, the church of Christ. What does it say there also? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Lines up with Acts where the church needs power. What do you need power for? One of the things you need power for is because you're supposed to storm the gates of hell. Amen. That's an offensive position. It's not you living your life and every time the devil challenges you, 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 you cry and ask God for help. No, this is you going to find the devil and, 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 and tearing him down. Amen, everybody. Amen. You're on the offense, not the defense. Why? Because you are the church of Christ. Amen. You are empowered from heaven. You're not waiting for the devil to attack you. You are attacking the devil. You are storming the gates of hell. Oh, I see, I see, okay. Well, it's a good thing we had service this morning. <laughs> now I have been <laughs> redirected. What is the purpose of the church of Christ? The first time in the Bible, church is mentioned by Jesus. Before the very same verse ends, he says, you are the church, and it says this, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Therefore, the purpose of the church is to storm the gates of hell. Amen. He says, and I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom, such as Acts, right? I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in the heavens. Praise God. Praise God. Everybody, short and to the point. What is the purpose of the church of Christ? First of all, Listen, you are born of something greater than just a Christian religion. When people ask you what your religion is, oh, that is such a small question. Uh, it's like, do you got a minute? I'll tell you, I'll tell you who I am. Do, do you got a minute? Like, this is not just some box I cross off on a sheet of paper. Like, what religion are you? No, 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 no. I am a member. I am born of the church of Christ. Amen. 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 And you see, the church of Christ, there is no denomination. In Christianity, I don't know, there's a thousand denominations, and one is divided against the other. The church of Christ is, is, is universal. It, 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 it is above all. Isn't that much better? See, we don't even know who we are sometimes. We are above it all, dividing nobody but uniting all, such as the church of Christ. There are no divisions in the church of Christ. There are no denominations in the church of Christ. There is very simply Christ. Amen. Christ. And one day we'll truly teach who is Christ. Who is Christ? I think we, we teach in degrees until we're ready to hear the things of the Father. Amen, everybody. Amen. So I want us to understand I have three simple points. Number one, the purpose of the church of Christ. Number one, the purpose of the church of Christ is not to enlarge the, the gates of hell. It is not to enlarge hell itself. Let me explain. A lot of times in our Christian religion, we think it's our responsibility to determine who is going to hell and, for, and who is going to heaven. And for some reason, you think you know who's going to hell. I don't know why you think you know who's going to hell, as if there's this final place of torment forever and ever, and you have just banished them to it. Really? My question to you is, are you sure that you're going to heaven? <laughs> I would say, you know, take a look at yourself first. And if I take a look at myself, I ain't, I ain't sending no one to hell. I got some stuff to do here. And those terms, right? You see, every religion on earth, when Christianity becomes one of religions on earth, we believe that it's our job to enlarge heaven. For some reason, for some strange reason, we think there's only a few people that are going to heaven and everybody else is going to hell. And we all seem to be fine with that because we're going to heaven. And we think that heaven is such a large place, although small population, and we think that heaven's mouth, hell's mouth is wide open. 
truth. According to our narrow definitions, we think that the purpose of the church is to enlarge hell by our beliefs, by our doctrine, by our damnation, by our unforgiveness, by our judgments. If you don't want to say amen, I'll say amen. amen. Good. Good. The purpose of the church of hell, church of Christ, is as Matthew says, it's not to enlarge hell, it's to shut it down. Amen. It's to empty it out and shut it down. Do you know that? Well, I do now. Thank you. Duly noted. Duly noted. I'll say it again. <laughs> the purpose of the church is not to enlarge hell. It is to empty it and shut it down. Because when God birthed the church, he said, along with that, my church, I give you power to storm the gates of hell. And you know, when he gave that message, he was standing at that black cave in Caesarea Philippi, where they thought was truly the gate of hell, where they thought they could hear the sounds of hell uh, 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 permeate through. You ever hear stories about people who drop microphones into the depths of the earth and say, for sure, they have heard the cries of hell? Well, Jesus Christ took them to one of those places. He took them to one of those caves where they said was the gates of hell. And at there he made the declaration. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell. He probably pointed right at that black cavern. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. As if he's saying, go get them. He said, I will empower you from on high and you will storm the gates of hell. Like from that point, they were supposed to leave Jesus and take off right into the, right into the dark cavern. Let's go get them, guys. <laughs> the purpose, I'm going to say a while on this point. The purpose of the church is not to enlarge hell. It is to empty it and shut it down. Amen, everybody. <laughs> Who? You, the church of Christ. He gave you the keys of the kingdom. He gave you the power to bind and loose. He gave you the power to do it. How do you do that? You restore the souls of mankind back to God. See, the purpose of the church is to restore all men back to God. See, the church is called Pentecost, but there is one more feast after Pentecost. It's called in gathering. It's the harvest. It's the harvest. You ever read about the harvest, the end time harvest? It's the feast of, after, uh, this feast of in gathering. And the church is the one that brings on the end time harvest. How do you bring on the end time harvest? Where do you get all these people from? Where do you get everybody from? How are we going to fill this church? Well, you get them from the pits of hell. That's where you get them from because they're all locked up and tormented. You got to storm the, you need a friend? Go storm the gates of hell and go pull a couple of buddies out. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. Yes. And sometimes we think that the will of God is just something that's said and stated and, 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 and we try to fulfill but will never be accomplished. If God says his will is to empty the gates of hell and to shut it down, I'm pretty certain that his will will be done. Amen. Now, I, I know, I, I ask that God would give us greater understanding. I pray that God would give you greater understanding of in gathering. I pray that God would give you greater understanding of the purpose of the church. Like God said, I give you power. I give you power to go preach the gospel. He says, go to Jerusalem, go to Judea, go to Samaria, go to the othermost parts of the earth. Why? Because he thinks you're going to fail in your mission? No, because he knows you'll succeed. So that means heaven will not be bankrupt. It means hell will be bankrupt. I want our minds to be changed. Amen, everybody. I want our minds to be absolutely changed. That heaven will not be bankrupt. Hell will. Because you are the church of God. And how do you do that? You awaken them to truth. You preach love. You preach forgiveness. And, and you don't, you, they don't, you have to just tell them what has already been done. You got to preach about the cross. The cross is something in their past. You got to tell them. You don't tell them that they're dirty, rotten scoundrels going to hell. You tell them, has anyone ever told you that God forgave you of your sins? Do you know that you're forgiven? Do you know that you're loved? Do you know that you are a child of God? Amen. And you restore life back to them. You restore hope back to them. You give them their life back. How do you do that? Well, you need power. You need power. But this is the purpose. Everybody, it's the purpose. Live your life that way. 
God, God gave you his power. He says, go storm the gates of hell and empty it out. And when it's all done empty, to just, just shut it down. Amen. Which will bring us to the final feast, which is tabernacles. It is in gathering. It is the end time harvest. This is the pure word of God. Amen, everybody. Know that. I pray that God speak to you from that place. The purpose of the church, number one, it is not to enlarge hell. Rather, it is to shut it down. Amen. Number two, it is to enlarge the kingdom of heaven. Otherwise, known as the feast of ingathering, it is the great time harvest. You see, we're supposed to empty hell and enlarge heaven. How many times do we preach in our religions that few people are going to heaven? And maybe we use passages like, uh, many are called but few are chosen. And it's true, there's few that are chosen. Actually, there's only one that's chosen. It is Christ. But somehow, I don't know, somehow we believe that Christ does not dwell in the hearts of all mankind. Sometimes we think that Christ just dwells in a few people. And if you think that, then hell has been enlarged and heaven has been emptied. But somebody has to be the church of God and somebody has to go tell them that the spark within them, which is called life, is Christ. Somebody has to believe first. That's why you have to be the church of Christ. The church of Christ is those who believe, right? First you got to believe and you got to go tell them that the breath of God that's in the lungs of all mankind, it's, it's, it's from day one. God breathed into mankind and, 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 and the only way that God, God is absent from a physical body is if they lose their breath. And then that body is no longer, no longer, it's, 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 it's fulfilled its purpose. But God dwells in every human heart. God dwells in every human, there is love inside of every human being. There is goodness inside of every human being. If you want to say that there's evil inside of every heart, well, okay, maybe that's true too. Because if I'm looking at you, I'd say maybe there's evil in all hearts. But there's also God. You see, there's this mystery that we live, everybody, like the power of God dwells in this messy flesh. But that's the Bible as it's written. You read the Bible, the Bible talks about the power of God that just dwells inside a messy flesh. Have you ever read the Bible? Have you ever read stories of like Abraham, Samson, David? Have you ever read the stories of the great heroes of faith, the ones we sing about? The great heroes of faith, they're the ones that live their life for God, they love God, but they were absolutely human. And sometimes we take the humanity of people and we damn them to hell because of their humanity. Well, then I'm going first. If you're going to damn people to hell because of their humanity, then I'm first in line and you are right behind me. <laughs> you are right behind me. And that's why there is a loving God. There is a loving God that somehow he can make a, a, a new creation. He can cause the two to become one somehow. And that somehow he can cause, he can cause you to live the, the power of God still inside of your messy flesh. And he, he will allow you to look past the, the, the mess of mankind and still see the goodness in them, the God in them. Amen. Amen. And when you perpetuate that, it increases and it grows. When you, when you get past the mess and you speak of the good and the God and the glory, it causes it to increase everybody. So the purpose of the church, number one, it is to empty hell. The purpose of the church of Christ is number two, it is to enlarge heaven, everybody. And then finally, I would say, it is very simply, it is to reconcile the lost. It is to restore all souls back to the Father. Now, if this is the plan of God, why do you think that God, why do you think that God put you on a plan that's not going to succeed? If Jesus Christ came to die upon a cross to save the world from their sins, why do you think that the Son of God failed? Why do you think that? Why do you think that? When Jesus Christ, am I reminded when he walked out of that tomb three days later, he walked upon a new earth and he knew that sin was destroyed. He, he was the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world to take away the sins of the world. And sometimes I think that he's the only one that knows it. Why? Because the church of Christ has not yet risen up. 
See, the church of Christ has received the power of God to tell them that their sins are forgiven because of the power of the cross. Are there any believers in the house? Does anybody believe in the power of the cross? Does anybody believe that their sins are forgiven? Is it just for you? Oh, that was a weaker answer. Didn't he, didn't he, yeah, you, you guys are still suck on yourself. Didn't he die for the world? Isn't he the savior of the world? Is he the savior of the world? Is he the son of God? Is he God become flesh? Then why is heaven so empty? Because your God is a failure? I think not. I think God is not done yet. I think the church has not quite risen up yet. I think us in our childhood and our immaturity are not ready to hear the mysteries of heaven. But the church in its time will show forth the mysteries of God and the mysteries of heaven. And you will receive power more and more. You will receive the words of God. You will be sent forth from the throne of heaven to tell the world, not that they're going to hell, to tell the world you are bound from heaven because God became a man and he died upon the cross and he saved you of your sins he said you're a child of God act like it live like it amen everybody amen. that's the truth amen. you got to tell them you're a child of God act like it somebody and listen I've been going to church my whole life sometimes you got to tap me on my shoulder and say listen you know you're a child of God right <laughs> I mean in this area here you got to kind of act like it <laughs> Like, I don't, like, you know, even in my childness and in, in, in religion, I must say, in our immaturity, you know, you think you do things in life. I'm going to heaven now. I'm going to hell. You know, you did something wrong. Okay, I'm going to hell now. We're so immature. We're so broken. But I pray that in our maturity, you grow up and you realize that God is faithful. <sighs> that he made a contract, that he died upon a cross. I pray this. I pray that the church of God arise. And the church of God arise, it, it, it rises up above all, all religions, above all worldly understandings and institutions. And we're sent forth with the power of God. And we're sent forth to do three things. Number one, empty hell. Number two, enlarge heaven. And number three, restore the souls of all mankind. For that is the reason why. The church of Christ was born. We sing the songs. And I know when we sing the songs, you're moved by them because of the spirit of God inside you. Amen. Amen. I believe when you hear the word of God, I believe the spirit of God inside of you rises up. Why do you think sometimes you sing these songs and, and, and you can feel the power and glory of God all over you? I believe that, that, that you believe it and you, you know it and, and in, in time God will reveal to us these truths. Amen, everybody. So praise the Lord. I'm going to ask you to stand and the praise and worship team will go forward. And this time let us sing these beautiful songs. Let us sing about the church of God and may the church of Christ truly arise. Everybody, God bless you. Amen. 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 That really is a beautiful song. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, praise God. Well, uh, Pastor Mike, thanks for sharing the stories of mom. I always enjoy those. <laughs> and say what you want, none of us have had our name on a marquee, so. <laughs> hey, <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> um, but yeah, bless God. And even as we, uh, you know, I think that's good too that, uh, you know, we share those stories uh, of uh, our mother and our father who, of course, you know, started New Image 36 years ago as we're entering into our anniversary. Um, and it's a God thing, right? I mean, um, you know, someone has got to push forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, even as we heard that uh, word today, I believe that to be true. Uh, you know, David said, uh, I think it's in Psalm 16, uh, it says that, uh, for thou will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will you suffer the Holy One to see corruption. Now, he penned it while he was alive, yet he had already experienced and been to hell, and he knew God was not going to leave him there. So, we do have to see hell differently, and I, I would imagine that many of us have maybe gone through some stuff in life, and you'd say, and that was pure hell. I don't want to ever do that again. Amen? And I believe that's what God was, uh, David was saying in that passage. Nor suffer the Holy One to see corruption. Who's the Holy One? Well, the Holy One, like Pastor Mike just said, it's Christ. We shouldn't see corruption. 
We shouldn't see brokenness. We shouldn't see defeat. We shouldn't see sin. We shouldn't see separation. Do not allow the Holy One to see that which is corrupt. What's corrupt? Anything that takes away from Christ. Well, no matter who they are, what they are, what they think they believe, don't believe, whether they don't believe in God at all, doesn't matter. They are still part of the body of Christ. Do not suffer the Holy One to see corruption. Only see the Christ in each other. Amen? Amen. And I believe God is birthing this right now. I do believe God is bringing about a greater revelation for us to, yes, think different. He also says that in Hebrews, that we're supposed to change the ordinance of priesthood and change the law. Now, he doesn't eliminate it. It changes. It changes. What changes? Well, it changes in the way we understand and, and believe. Yes, it's all foundational. He didn't say eliminate it, <laughs> but he does add to it. He builds upon it. And of course, the, the new law, it is grace, church. The old covenant wasn't grace. The new one is, though. And we change the order of things, which is no longer just the tribe of Levi. Remember, you can only be a priest if you're a Levi. The new one is Melchizedek. Who is that? That's us. It's Christ. He changed the order. We're all kings and priests. He changed the order of things. How did he do that? Through Calvary. Through Calvary. I believe that to be true. Amen. Let's go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we are, of course, grateful today, Lord God. Uh, grateful always for your love, Lord God for your salvation, Lord God, because yes, we are forgiven, Lord, and we pray for redemption, Lord God, uh, for our redemption, Lord, so that we would also then go and redeem others, Lord God, and we pray, Lord God, that you would give us that strength and that power which is endued from on high, and as we go, Lord God, that we would not see corruption, Lord God, but perhaps just see the opportunity to redeem and help and save others, Lord God. So we thank you for this call, Lord, for this word, Lord God, for this family, Lord, and for all that you are doing. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.